Folks, welcome to Vintage Baseball Reflections. I am Tom, the Baseball Nostalgia Guy, bringing you these treasured pieces. Do you miss the good old days of listening to baseball through radios? It was a classic pastime that stood for decades and shaped how we cherish baseball in our heroes. These stories are from a moment in time that were heard by fans just like you. They are uncut, unfiltered, simply here for you to enjoy. So I just want you to enjoy this reflection on baseball history. From Day to DeRocher to Yost, it's double play with DeRocher and Day. With their guest, Eddie Yost, here's another chapter of double play with DeRocher and Day. Welcome to another visit with baseball's most exciting and controversial couple, Lorraine Day and Leo DeRocher, with their guest for today, Mr. Eddie Yost. Right now, let's listen to Leo and his guest, Eddie Yost, of the American League. There seems to be a slight difference of opinion over the qualities of the two leagues. You know as well as I do, Eddie, that we've got a better league than the American League, that's all. Every man to his own opinion, but uh, I know we don't have too many 220 hitters. Come on. Oh, wait a minute. Now, come on, you break it up or we'll never have a chance to get all the Well, Why, I want to argue a little bit about the league. Oh, there you are, you see? (laughs) See who's the manager? See how much he pays attention to me, too? Uh, (laughs) Well, well, poor Leo just can't seem to win an argument with a guest who remembers his old 220 batting average. But let's start batting a thousand with this message. And now back to Double Play with DeRocher and Day. Friends, I'd like you to meet Eddie Yost, the star third baseman of the Washington Senators, who's our guest on Double Play tonight. Before we get into this first letter, I want to ask you, what is the third baseman's toughest play? The, uh, the uh, well, the sizzler that's hit right at him or the swinging bump? Well, now, let me tell you, I want to... Now, listen, uh, just a minute. Eddie is the leadoff batter. You always hit eight. Now, let Eddie answer this. Here we go again at eight business, 220. You're the one who hit eight, not I. Go ahead. All right. Well, I believe it's the uh, swinging bunt, and also when the uh, runner is on first and second, and the bunt plays, in, uh, that's the situation. The uh, bunt play is coming up. Nobody out. You have a tough decision there to either go in and get the ball or wait for the pitcher to come across and make the play at third base. All right. You're so smart. Go ahead. What is a swinging bunt? Well, dear, when you played, it was any time you hit the ball. But when Eddie Yost and anyone else plays, it's when they take their regular swinging stance and top the ball in the infield. All oh, right? see, reading those books again, Eddie, you see? <laughs> yeah. No, it's just talking to third baseman like Eddie Yost and all of our wonderful guests. Well, let's get to the first question. This is from Gerald Evans, Newport News, Virginia, and Gerald wants to know. He says, out of the ballpark, I often hear fans yell to the batter, foul off the bad one. Uh, this is what I hear, too, when uh, they used to pitch Daddy Stanky. Right. Well, he says, is it possible for a batter to do this? And if so, why does he do it? Why doesn't he just let the bad ones go and get a base on ball? Well, it's all according to the uh, type of hitter he is. If he's uh, like Yogi Bear, for example, he might go after those bad ones when he has a couple of strikes on him and foul them off. He'll probably get a good pitch, or he might even hit a bad pitch. But fellas uh, like Stanky myself, we've developed the skill of letting those bad pitches go and having them become balls rather than fouling them off and having them be a strike. And he's one of the best in baseball at it, I know. Uh, but when Stanky played for me, I know that uh, Stanky's theory was that if you needed a run or if he had to get on base, uh, he'd get up to the plate and he invariably took two strikes. He'd stand there and he'd creep up close to the plate and he'd crouch down and if he ever got the pitcher three and two... Uh, invariably, he would wind up getting a walk because when the pitcher just aimed the ball and fired right down through the middle, Eddie had purposely just pulled the bat around and fouled it down third base. He didn't try to hit the ball fair. He deliberately pulled it foul uh, uh, until the pitcher finally threw him a bad one until he could get a base on ball. Well, you mean he would foul off the good ones? He That's right. He foul off the bad well, ones. Well, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty hard to foul off the bad ones. Uh, some of your greatest hitters in baseball were what is known, as Eddie will tell you, bad ball hitters. Yogi Berry is one. When Joe Medrick was a player, they always said, if you would wait until you got a good one, you'd hit 400. Well, Medrick hit 375, hitting the bad ones. And he may have <laughs> never hit a good one. I don't know. I, I like the fellow that swings the bat. He may... Uh, he may have hit 220. Sure. Hit a good one. Yes, I know. I used to wait until I got the good ones, and I was in the bench. The umpire said, that'll be all. Eddie, you know, um, in the National League, it seems that uh, all the clubs hate to go into Brooklyn to play. They say that not only are you playing against 
the Brooklyn team, which is a pretty powerful team. Every man scares you to death when he comes up to the plate, but you're also playing against oh, about Oh, I don't 30. know about that. Oh, you ought to know about this. <laughs> Plays against about 30,000 fans who are strictly for Brooklyn, of course. And I understand in the American League that all the teams hate to come into the Yankee Stadium to play. Now, is this true? Well, I personally love to come to New York because uh, this is my home. I live over in Queens. But as far as the uh, rest of the team is concerned, I really can't say. But I do know the Yankees play good ball at home. They do very well, and I, maybe it's just Cleveland and Boston that hates to come into New They don't do very well there. Why is it? Do you think it's the same reason that as it well, is? Well, I think that every... We dread to go into Brooklyn? Well, now, just a minute. Who said we dread to go into Brooklyn? All the players on your team. Oh, well, then they're keeping they it a secret me. from me. I don't, we seem to do pretty good in Brooklyn, and I don't think anyone dreads it. I think the Yankee Stadium is such a large park, and it's a pitcher's paradise. There's a lot of room. They let them hit the ball in the outfield. And uh, I think the fellows who are pull hitters, like Eddie is a dead pull hitter, and uh, you got to hit. You, you must hit right down the line. Well, that's baseball talk. <laughs> and you must hit the ball down the line in the stadium. If you hit it straight away while you're a big easy out like you are on the polo grounds, there's so much space out there. Well, is there any park that you don't like to play in? Washington is about the only ballpark that I really don't like playing in is because I am a pull hitter, and uh, the fence out there is 408 feet away. <laughs> so it's uh, pretty difficult to hit a little, uh, home run out there. I'd hit two or three out there, Eddie, every day. You know me. And uh, nothing for me to hit the ball down that line. Absolutely right. It's nothing. If I had two swings at it, I could. <laughs> nothing. All clubs like to play in their home park better than they do on the road. I think right now we should let our sponsor get in a few pitches. Now back to double play with Leo DeRocher and Lorraine Day. Well, let's go to this question sent in by Vincent... Kingerly, I imagine that's how he pronounces his name, Wilmington, Delaware, who says, uh, is there any rule or is it absolutely necessary that a player must serve an apprenticeship in the minor leagues before advancing to the majors? I'd very much appreciate your answer. Well, we know that, that there is no rule about it because we have bonus players and players that come directly out of college into baseball, but um, you yourself, you didn't serve in the minors, did you? That's right, I did. I've heard Leo say many well, times that he thinks players should serve in the minors. And I heard that you wrote a letter to the commissioner once requesting that he send you down to the minors to play. Now, now this is an unusual story. I think he's probably the only ball player in the entire history of uh, ball playing, <laughs> of baseball, that has ever written a letter requesting to be sent to the minors. Well, I didn't know that Eddie uh, had come right out of San Lotta, semi-professional ball, and right in the major leagues. And I certainly would like to hear that. I came right out of college in 1944, where I played with Ralph Franca, one of your former pitchers. And... Uh, then I went into the Navy in 45. Did you pitch in the Navy? Or I'm mean, uh, <laughs> yes, thinking of pitchers. You're thinking of Franca now. <laughs> no, I meant, you mentioned yes, Franca. Yes, I played, uh, played. Uh, I played baseball up at uh, Sampson, New York, and uh, Mickey Owen caught for us up there, and Stanley pitched. Uh, we had a pretty good ball club. Did he have that palm ball in the Navy? I imagine he did. <laughs> he won about eight games for us and didn't lose. And uh, the next year I went to Bainbridge, was, uh, which was 46, I was discharged in uh, July and joined the Washington Ball Club. Finished out that season with him, and then uh, in the spring of '47, I came uh, to spring training with the Washington Ball Club. But uh, Mr. Griffith had plans of sending me to Chattanooga. I didn't care. I thought it would be a good idea to go because I hadn't had too much experience and I didn't think I was ready. So uh, he had to get waivers on me, and he couldn't do it. Uh, a couple of teams claimed me. And then uh, he thought that uh, if I wrote a letter to the commissioner and I agreed with him, that uh, we might be able to, uh, you know, you wouldn't have to get waivers if it was up to the individual ball player. So I did write a letter to Commissioner, Ch commissioner Chandler, who was the commissioner at the time. He said, no dice. So I had to remain with the ball club. And about after a month, I broke into the lineup and I've been playing ever since. Well, I think Rex Barney was another one who requested to be sent out to... Uh, yes, of course, team. Rex uh, lost his confidence and couldn't get the ball over the plate, and he had hit a few players, and uh, he had lost all confidence in, in himself, and he wanted to go down to a lower league classification and see if he couldn't regain his confidence and poise and uh, come back to the major leagues again. But uh, to go back a number of years, uh, I know several players. In the olden days, you just very seldom come out of college or school 
and uh, went right into the major leagues. I know Frisch did it, but Joe Medwick served uh, four years in the minor leagues before he came up to the major leagues. And Marty Marion, who was one of the game's greatest shortstops, was eight years in the minor leagues. How old was he? Eight years. And Stanky was a long time in the minor leagues. Let me ask you this question. Say you have a, a great first baseman like Gil Hodges or like our own Whitey Lockman, and you have a, a fine young first baseman in the minor leagues. Yeah. It's awfully tough on this fellow to get up to the major leagues because when is Whitey Lockman going to be through playing? As far as I'm concerned, I hope Whitey Lockman is never through playing first base for the New York <laughs> Giants. And uh, we have a, a, a very fine prospect uh, playing now in the minor leagues in the Pacific Coast League. Uh, I just don't uh, know whether that is a detriment to him or not, uh, that there is a fine first baseman on the parent club in Whitey Lockman. Well, it, uh, of course it is. He can't well, get a break to come up. He may not get a break to come up with the parent club, but there are other clubs who are more than interested in Hilke Gilbert. That's the boy we're thinking of. And uh, they have already sounded us out trying to make deals with us for Tookie Gilbert. And if we get together and say, Whitey Lockman is good for five, six, seven, eight, ten years at first base, we will deal Tookie Gilbert to another major league club, and he will get his opportunity to play. Yes, but don't you think uh, that um, maybe a boss is going to say, but what if something should happen to Whitey Lockman? Let's hope nothing ever That's happens right. to me, But you have to protect yourself. You can't. You've got to find young prospects. You cannot... Uh, uh, take a chance on something happening to Whitey and then having no one. I know of no uh, manager or owner who cried because he had too many good ball players. I'm not talking about the manager or owner. I'm talking about the, the ball player, how tough it is on the ball player. It's to tough on the to ball the player, but I'd like to have a lot of them. I, wanna, <laughs> I, I hope I have a lot of them that it's tough on. You're not going to get me to say that I don't want good ball players. I'm not asking you to say that you All don't right. want good ball players. All, All I'm right. saying is... Isn't it tough on Tookie Gilbert to belong to the New York Giants when we've got Whitey Lockman who is playing such a sensational it's first It's tough day? if he can't outplay Whitey Lockman. That's my answer. Oh, this is the way it always is on That's the show. Baseball. We get into a big argument, and he always wins, and I never get any offers to manage a club. It's pretty tough, isn't it, Eddie? Get a load of this, Eddie. She second-guesses me every night. Don't worry. It does him good. It keeps him sharp. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, Eddie, it's been wonderful having you on our show, and... Uh, the fans have enjoyed meeting you as much as I have because I had never met you up until the show, and I hope that I can see you play sometime. Thank you. In the World I, Series. I, Eddie, I hope that we you. can. <laughs> yes, I hope that we can get into the World Series with you. And I've seen you play a number of times, Eddie. And all I can say is, good luck and really give it to him and have a real good year. Thank you, Leo. And thank you, fans, for being with us. We'll see you next week, same time, same station. So long. You've been listening to another chapter of Double Play with baseball's most exciting couple, Lorraine Day and Leo DeRocher. Today, Lorraine and Leo had as their guest, Eddie Yost. Join us when again it's time for Double Play with Leo DeRocher and Lorraine Day plus another big-time guest star. Double Play is produced by Marty Martin, directed by Ted Nealon, and is a Martez production. VintageBaseballReflections.com features a treasure chest of baseball audio. The wonderful thing is the audio isn't a guy like me or a few talking heads reflecting on players, seasons, or teams. It is the actual players from that era, announcers from that era, giving you an uncut, unfiltered, unrecent day stance on what it was like then. These are real-time clips from that era. Now, we encourage you to check out our entire back catalog of baseball audio. And if you like old-time games, and folks, and folks, you are not alone. Join the membership section to enjoy interacting with fans, scoring games with folks just like you, and listening to hundreds 
of radio broadcasts that were baseball classics. As a special offer to you, type in This Day in Baseball for a discount just for you. And if you enjoyed the show, hit the plus sign to subscribe, follow us on the socials, and above all, share us with your friends who love baseball history just like you.